Hello, we're back. Welcome back to the Texas Poker Experience, y'all. I'm Caitlin Kameski. I'm here with Craig Sear, and we are back to talk about Texas poker. And I think I should let y'all know that I may be like enemy number one in Austin right now because I did refuse to chop the Tuesday free roll. So put your pitchforks down. I'm still a good lady, but no, I did not chop the Tuesday free roll. What do you think about that, Craig? Wasn't well, that kind of your thing? You've like not chopped. You don't yeah, chop. Yeah, that's what I told them. And I mean, I felt bad because it's like it's a free roll. You know, everyone's in for about two hundred dollars. We've locked up like three hundred. The chop value at the time was like everyone got like two k or something. And um, it was three in the morning, and everybody wanted to go home. Like I think half the people at the table had jobs, but I don't, and I'm still pretty fresh. It's pretty normal for me to be up at three a.m. <coughs> and I I want the the seven k up top. I'm on a little bit of a roll, and I think it was sixty five hundred. But um, yeah, it still just amazes me how many people will enter a poker tournament, be annoyed when they're at the final table because of how late it is. When it's like that is that is it started what, at seven. Yeah, <laughs> that is what you were after when you signed up. When you this enter is the a tournament, result. you hope to get to the final table. Now you are there, and you are annoyed that it is still going on. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's aw- It's become an awkward thing because I've made because I've been fortunate enough to make so many final tables this year. It's been really awkward um, having the conversation of, no, I don't chop. I've never chopped. I don't intend on chopping. I talk very publicly about not chopping, and that's just. Would you equate we're that be to playing this bitch out? <laughs> would you equate that to they both involve high amounts of variance? Would you equate that to like running it more than once in a cash game? Some some people Rex they really want to run it twice, three times even, and you're just like, sorry, I mean, just run it once. Like I'm not afraid it's of variance. It's absolutely Let's do the it. the equivalency from cash to tournament, like not chopping and um like running it multiple times. And I think sort of the rule of thumb should be the same across the issues where it's like as long as you're consistent. No, no one can really call you a dick if you always run it once and you're like, I'm a one timer that everybody knows they get in a pot with you. They accept it. That's the norm. Um, and if you always run it twice, but if like you're only running it once when you have a premium, like, yeah, you're a dick. And like if you're only chopping when you're the short stack, like, yeah, you're kind of a dick. I think the only consistency with how many times we're going to run it is that no one ever wants to fucking decide. And that drives me insane. As oh, it's a like, oh, you call it. You call it. I'm the good guy. You call it whatever you want. I tell people that all the time. People are like, oh, you probably hate when people run it twice, huh, as the dealer, because you got to chop the pot up or whatever. I'm <laughs> like, I don't care how many times you run it. Just make a choice. Like, let's not spend 90 seconds figuring it out. Let's just do it. Could be done and over with already. Oh, that's so funny. I, I actually drunk texted Doug Polk um, within the last two that I, just, I know. <laughs> I was playing 1-3 at the – or 1-2 at the Lodge, which, like, I don't do that often. But it is a great 1-2 game. They always have mini games running. We're going to talk more about uh, Lodge later in the episode. But I drunk text to Doug because I was sitting in a 1-2 game. We were doing double board bomb pots and we were doing uh, – everyone was getting it in and they were running it three times. And it was like bed bedlam. Is that the word? Bedlam. Yeah, yeah. You it could was describe it that way. Insanity or chaos to chop a pot three ways, and then like someone would try to do the shortcut and get the math wrong, or then the person who's getting the one third doesn't understand it. We need to walk them through it, or it's taking forever to do this, and all of a sudden this person who wasn't paid attention the whole time, he's like, "Wait, isn't that a straight?" And then like we start, start all over, over yeah. again. <laughs> and I think like. Uh, I had seen like seven hands and a down and I was like, you've got to outlaw this shit between these double board bomb pots. And the thing I hate about double board bomb pots is the speed. Like I like the game. I think it's cool, but it's just like nobody like when we're playing them, especially at a hold'em game and we're playing a PLO bomb pot, nobody knows how to play them. So they have to spend forever. They're not used to looking at four cards. They're not used to reading two boards and it's just everybody moves like molasses. I can't stand it. I have a take on this there's a rumor going around started by myself that (laughs) i am kind of anti bomb pot now i think i'm over them controversial yeah i think i'm over them they're a lot of fun they're big pots which people like but you can play big pots in hold them as well uh or you can play big pots in plo you don't really need to like mix the two things i think you're playing a variant that most people don't know and you're mixing it in at a variant that they do know or at least they are familiar with. 
And so you're at a one, two hold'em game and you're asking them to play a massive pot in PLO. I mean, people make the most elementary error in not even understanding the three card, two card combo that has to happen. They put a shitload of money in because they have the ace of spades and there's four spades on the board. I mean, that that happens all the time. And that's just the beginning of it. You're just scratching the surface. I used to love it when I like in like 2020, 2021, when I was like not in poker media yet. And I was like just a cash grinder game organizer at like two five games. I used to love bomb pots. And I'd say most of my profit was coming from bomb pots mm-hmm. just because people would just be potting and getting like rock hard over second and third nuts yeah. <laughs> on one or they're just like only on one side and you quarter them. Yeah. The, the principle that I think it boils down to, I've had a lot of people ask me over the years, just like, Oh, do you think this is good for the game? Do you think this is good for the game? I think good for the game is good for the wreck. That's what it always comes down to, to me. Mm. If it's something that favors pros, pros already have the advantage. Yeah. So it needs to favor the wrecks. And I think I was one of the toughest critics on the lodge when they were going to do no bomb pots. Players wanted them. That was clear. That's why they brought them back. But I think in general, it's just, I just don't think they're good for the game. They're, they are slow when you're paying by the hour in these clubs. And oh, yeah. At the, they at take the time forever games, yeah. to sort one out. There's a contingent of people that think a dealer comes in for a down, you deal a bomb pot, then they deal like eight hold'em hands, and then the dealer's down is done. Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. So they deal like one orbit, not even, in 30 minutes. That's insane. It's And that's certainly not good for the pro, seeing that few hands. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not fully anti-bomb pot yet, but I'm I'm really getting there pretty close had a hairy situation last week in a game that i was dealing that was my own mistake but you know whether or not a hand was tabled or not and then i mean the hand was the hand was tabled i absolutely saw all of the players cards but at that point everyone helping to read the hand had misread the hand and missed a backdoor flush on a paired board that just really you're not expecting to be good anyway so no one's really looking for it but it happened to be good in a very large pot and side pot it was missed. The player turned their own hand face down when they realized they were scooped. Oof. And then I didn't scoop it into the muck, which ceases to matter because it was tabled. It doesn't matter. But he picked them back up after and said, oh, I made a flush on the bottom. Ooh. And so he was entitled to half of yeah. the, this player's chips and half of the person that scooped the main's chips. And so it was like taking chips away from players. And I'm sitting here oh, and I'm like, you know, that, yeah. we got eight players in this game. We've got five cards, not four. And it's just, I mean, a thousand in the main and a thousand in the side. It's like just there's so much money. It's so many cards. And everybody just fucking cranks them over at the same time. And you're looking at 15 cards per player trying to figure yeah. out what they have. <laughs> I was like that moment of dealers getting really stressed when there's a side pot and like the person for the main who's like when they're like so excited because they made their hand and they scoop the main and then the like stressed out dealer like a mom with the kids in the back seat getting a really like I need to see these two hands first. Everyone, sh- <laughs> everyone <laughs> like, shut the down. fuck up. <laughs> it's because there is a procedure to it. And that's what went haywire in this hand is like I wasn't following uh, the most yeah. basic of procedures, which is like you don't award a pot until a hand has been either killed or remains faithful up and you trade the pot for it most of the time you don't need to do that and this isn't a private game so you really i mean no one was really upset about this but it did cause, did cause a lot of conversation I and that's why you'll hilarious hear that you're like a private game dealer primarily but you're the most anal retentive about casino and rules <laughs> and regulations no but i'm not any dealer i know you're such a tight ass <laughs> no but i'm really not because it comes to certain things that i think are just just procedural and i tell people this all the time i'm like you know what to hell with that rule that's a rule that if someone wants to it exists so that people can't exploit people in this way and if people are exploiting people in that way because we don't have that rule here there's the door get out (laughs) you're a piece of shit leave (laughs) this is a neighborhood game it's a friendly game you know everybody here knows each other we're here to network it's not even really about the money so like if you're here to try and squeeze an extra three dollars an hour out of somebody by angling them in that way then just leave that's interesting you say like we're here to network primarily i feel like that's such like a huge argument when people talk about like women in poker and getting more women in the game and like the work that i do with chloe and um Mm -hmm. educating beginner women here in austin i think is so important because it's like 
so much networking is always talked about. It happens on the poker table. It happens out on the golf course. And like, if you don't like to golf because you're not like a fucking freak, then poker is a great alternative to learn how to like get out there and like be like sort of elbow your way to the front of the boys club and uh, get your bag, you know? Yeah. And it's a huge thing for live poker versus any other form, you know, on the apps or anything online or anything like that. Yeah. One of my most recent table customers is a guy that's a dealer at Shuffle, and he's starting a company called Texas Poker Culture, which is really cool. He's just doing pretty much anything he can do to, like, enhance live poker in any way that you can versus, like, you know, teaching teaching people that are learning how to play, teaching dealers how to deal because he's a dealer himself and a very good one. Um, I just thought it was a neat business idea to be like oh let's do this so he's got you know one table from me with hopes for more in the future and doing like corporate events to get people playing a lot similar things you're talking about that chloe's doing just to get people involved in live poker not playing on these yeah silly apps that people and i mean chloe who i collaborate she's a real chloe chang look up uh, her um instagrams and all that um you know, she's she's a realtor, so it's, like, so great for her to hold these events and, like, expand her book and get around people. And, like, there's so many jobs like that where, you know, it's important to build your client base. I think if you're a realtor and you are not involved in poker in some way, shape, or form, you are missing the boat. Yeah, you're leaving money on the table for sure. It's such a great, great way to meet tons of people. So, welcome back to the Texas Poker Experience, everybody. It has been how many days... I won't say the exact number because you make fun of me for it, but it's been yeah, over a year. Yeah, you always know the exact number of dates. It's very impressive. It's been over a year. So we've got a lot to catch up on on what's going on with <laughs> the Texas poker scene. Um, I think one of the most exciting things happening in Texas is that we're now having like these big tournaments all across the state. Of course, the Lodge was sort of the first club to do like a six-figure guarantee tournament within the last couple of years. But now, within the last like 18 months, we've had multiple million-dollar guarantees. Um, I've competed in a lot of them. There was the Poker Atlas tour stop at TCH Dallas, which um, made the guarantee. And um, cr- I, don't, I don't know if it crushed it, but it definitely like covered the guarantee and then some. And then... Um, down in Houston at uh, Champions, they recently had a million dollar guarantee event. It was a, uh, I believe, a fifteen or sixteen hundred dollar buy in. Anyway, I actually made final two tables on that one, and it was an incredible turnout. Champions is a great club because they've they're the only ones in Texas right now that I know of where they have like accommodations on site, and they're really supporting um, the uh, out of state traveler more so than other. Um, Texas clubs it's like they remodeled an old Ramada Inn or I don't know what the exact hotel was but so they've got um, the bottom floor is the restaurant bar and then I think they've got about like 15 to 20 tables I don't know the exact number and they ran a really great event they've got incredible staff and the food is really good like they have like a, lots of options and they serve like a late night options till like 2 a.m. so I really enjoyed my experience at Champions and look forward they also have a partnership with Poker Go so they're having the PGT the Poker Go tour come to Houston for the first time. I think this is the first time Poker Go is going outside of Vegas, certainly to Texas. And they're going to be streaming a lot of these final tables. We're going to have a lot of high rollers coming into Houston. So I haven't been to Champions. I've heard really, really good things from everyone that's ever talked about it at all. I haven't heard anything negative. Uh, The interesting thing with the tournaments is there are... Uh, How many brands we have? Texas Card House is Uh in multiple cities. Shuffle is in multiple cities, and um, Shuffle's not really a tournament. They run dailies and stuff, but they're they're not hosting big events, are they? They have. They've like they've they've done it a little bit to kind of test the waters, and I think they're going to do it more. Okay. Um, And then you have Poker House. They have four or five you know locations throughout yeah poker throughout house the just opened up a uh, caddy corner to the lodge um, mm-hmm. up in round rock and that is um, a club that's changed hands a few times they have a beautiful beautiful facility and they have a restaurant and bar unfortunately there's just been some issues with management and um, getting games going and the fact that you know they got a lodge right across the street but poker house has taken over the letterhead and they've been there for how many months now 
couple. A couple. I think they're Two, like four, officially grand opening this month, but they've been you know, they under soft, soft opening, opening okay. for a long time. But they just announced a huge, this is why they're able to do these massive guarantees when they have clubs in different cities, is they do their, you know, pre-qualifying flights, so to speak. You know, their early flights they can do in Fort Worth in Austin, in San Antonio, yeah. all kind of simultaneously. And then it's like, if you bag and you make day two, then you go to this club. And yeah. that's when you travel. So that takes the travel out of it for a lot of people. And it's like, you're only traveling if there's good news because you bagged and you're going on, which is nice. No, I mean, there've been a lot of collaborations even within separate brands. Do you remember the I-35 Cup yep. where Rounders yep. in San Antonio and The Lodge both held day one flights and then day two, I think was at The Lodge. It might've been a Rounders, I don't remember. But it was like, <laughs> you know, cooperation between the two clubs. And I think a huge reason why these tournaments are so successful in Texas independently through the clubs is because of the gaming commission, these mid-major um, clubs like Run Good that I'm sporting. I'm an ambassador for Run Good and um, like MSPT and the WSOPC, they can't come to Texas because they risk their status with the gaming commission because Texas is an unregulated state still in within like there's no gaming commission. So that's why these mid-major tours can't come in. So it's like up, it leaves this like gaping hole. Texas is a huge state. If someone from San Antonio wants to go to, um, uh, excuse me, Oklahoma, which would be like the nearest mid-major stop, that's going to be like a six hour drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe seven, seven or eight, maybe. I just can't understand why all these people want to play in poker tournaments. I still just think they're the absolute bane of existence. I've, I've sort of, I've, when I started doing like poker media and getting more and more opportunities in poker media, one of the ways that I would be compensated for like my labor, my time, my social media, whatever was through tournament buy-ins. And then it's really hard to get like a poker company a lot of times to give you money outright. So within the last couple of years, a lot of my opportunities have been in tournament buy-ins. So in order for me to convert sort of whatever, like, clout or social media presence I have for me to convert that into real dollars in my pocket that I can spend, I have to cash tournaments. And it's been really fun and interesting because most of the training and studying I had done had been around 100 big blind cash games and to really like adjust and get into the GTO wizard and study more of the, the short stack spots and all the different adjustments has been really interesting and i think it suits me in a lot of ways well for anyone that's listening that doesn't live and play in texas they know that 100 big blind cash doesn't exist that's true it's deep stack deep stack poker here in texas yeah which is also i think not good for the game but that's a different thing it's it's a hell of a lot of fun it's really fun to play deep and then mm -hmm. the silly game that I used to have at my house a long time ago was 25 cent, 50 cent, but uncapped. And people were just like, would buy in for thousands and thousands. And it's just, just to highlight the ridiculousness that is Texas poker where someone's playing in a 25 cent, 50 cent game on paper and they're sitting with, you know, $14,000 in front of them. <laughs> it's just so funny, but it does, no limit. it does change the <laughs> dynamic a lot. I bet it does. <laughs> And speaking of multi-city clubs, another thing to report is I uh, heard Doug Polk on Joey Ingram the other day talking about how the Lodge is looking to aggressively expand Ooh to wee. other cities. Uh, I think staying within state lines, they kind of, they said they kind of looked around, but there's just too much regulatory red tape. Gotta and it be, just yeah. seems to make more sense. They have a strong brand here, so I think they're going to be looking into the other major cities in Texas and be expanding. That's wild. Do you think it's going to be bumpy at first? No, I don't. You think because it's going to be smooth? Smooth is better? They have an absolute marketing superpower in Andrew Nimi and yeah. Brad Owen and Doug himself. Like, they just, I mean, you have, a, you have a marketing arm that's just game. built in. They have a stream. I mean, everything's just built right in. So the marketing just happens. It's so easy for them. Yeah, no, Lodge is really, they're, they're, playing, they're playing the long game here. <clears throat> they don't seem too interested in... Uh, pocketing a lot of profit early on they they're they're hell-bent on uh, texas domination well and doug talked about that specifically he said you know if, if people are viewing a stream as okay if we get to this many subscribers then it'll you know it's monetized and you can make these if it makes money great it's marketing yeah it's a marketing arm the stream is and he said you make the stream as great as you can 
but the purpose of the stream is to drive you to an already proven model, which yep. is the lodge. So he says you have the stream, and the stream is entertaining, and it's great, and people watch. But really, you want people watching the stream so that they're like, you know what? I'm going to go play at the lodge. Yeah. And it works. I mean, they have 20, 20, tables a night, 20 tables of cash every day. It'll be interesting to see how the rollout into the other cities goes, because it's like TCH in Dallas has like a stranglehold on that city. Mm-hmm. Like they have every table of their club is full filled every like night. every time i've been there like they I've have ne- to rope off tables for their nightly tournaments that they run so that they don't get filled with cash and they have to kick people off no i've never been inside the dallas tch location where there wasn't an ass in every seat in the room and like a crowd of people in the lobby waiting um so like the demand is there they expanded into los Colinas, and i've talked a little bit with um my, my Dallas girlies are uh, Casey and Poker Face Ash. And uh, they say the Los Colinas location is really good, too. They've got a lot of, like, fresh blood. You know, whenever you open a brand new club, you're going to drum up all these people that have only ever played basement poker with mm-hmm. their buddies. And so it's going to be softer than a baby's bottom, you know? I heard that that place, the action was insane. And then I was in Dallas for some other business and I was like, Oh, I'm not far away. I'm about 25 minutes away. So I went and I checked it out and I played, it was super small sample size, but I played at one table. It was the nittiest table I've ever played at, I think in my life. And so I got a transfer, went to another one and it was only better because it couldn't possibly have been worse. It was not good. And so I Left Do we know anything after. about like what kind of locations they're talking about for the expanding into new locations? Because it's like Rounders in San Antonio is the club to be. There are a couple of other smaller clubs with fewer tables that I think keep the lights on. But, you know, Rounders is the place to be in San Antonio. In Houston, um, Houston's kind of the most volatile market that I'm familiar with because they've had the most scandal. They had the shuffle uh, machine scandal and they've had more shootings than any other city. Um, they're the only clubs in Texas where there's like a, uh, a metal detector and tighter security in Texas, just because of all those instances. And I'm glad they're there. I feel very safe. I've played at prime and champions recently, and I felt really safe in both clubs. Um, but there is like that added bump of security that you'd see compared to an Austin or a Dallas club. Houston's also very different because it's fucking huge. Compared to Austin and San Antonio, it's an it's a massive, oh massive God, city. Yeah. The demographics are insane. And then geographically, it's also huge. Dallas is huge, but it's it's Dallas and it's the Metroplex. So it's not just Dallas. And Dallas is like kind of locked out. There's the two clubs that are there and that legal situation is still ongoing. So there's not going to be anyone new in Dallas proper. So that leaves everything else. But people call it Dallas. They don't call it. Fort Worth, they don't call it Plano, they don't call it, you know, all these yeah. other suburbs, Arlington and all these other cities that, you know, surround Dallas. That's kind of where all these other clubs are limited to, which kind of kills some of the demographic power that is in the Metroplex. Whereas in Houston, it's like the Wild West, just like it is here, but there's only a couple million people in Austin. Whereas there's like, I don't know the actual demographics, but there's got to be five to eight million people in Houston, I would think. What insider information can you share that you know from the Lodge team? For those of you that don't know, Craig works a lot with the Lodge with the felting of their tables and stuff like that. He's he's our inside man. Do you know any other about like if they're going to try to put streams up right away at the other clubs or if the stream is just going to be in Austin? I don't know anything about the streams. I do know that they're making a change to the stream here which is interesting i don't know if that's been unveiled so i'm not gonna say what it is but there will be (sighs) a change i do know that um i'm gonna build them a new stream table at some point that's gonna happen this year been talking with uh, their producer a lot about that gonna make some changes to their actual table and i don't know about if any new clubs it's hard to say because they don't even have those clubs yet i think they're shopping locations and all that stuff now. So I don't know if they're planning to do the streams. I think they've fallen into a really good rhythm at Lodge Live at the the stream house in terms of what games they're running when. How Because it's like when they first launched the stream and they were going to be doing these high stakes games every week, I think like all the locals were like, where are you going to get all these players from, honey? They're like five people that can play that high every week. Like, yeah. this is not sustainable. So, um, and I think they ran up against that like really quickly 
quickly and realize like, yeah, we don't have, you know, the money in the city to be running 50, hundred games, uh, multiple times a week. So now they have sort of like a monthly event where they have like players like Brazil, God, uh, Juan, Mariano, Nick Airball, that they come in and they curate these games around them. Um, and they have these like crazy crypto European guys that, that live local that come and splash around well. And then in the interim, they do lower stakes games. They feature their tournaments more, which Lodge was always the tournament house. Like when when Lodge, like I think I look back to like quarantine times when like the clubs were all fairly new, like 2019. Lodge was like an old refurbished blockbuster that had the yeah. best tournaments in town. And that's how they captured the one two crowd, which is like how you dominate local is you just you capture the one two crowd and they did that by hosting these tournaments and getting people to stay inside their doors um after running these tournaments so it's always been the tournament house Mm -hmm. yeah still don't get why people want to play poker tournaments but (laughs) all the power to them i'm i'm the weirdo i'm telling you there's a lot of people that like them i'm like the weirdo that that despises them i haven't played a poker tournament in a decade don't care to it's weird how like different tastes and preferences evolve like you know two years ago i really could give a shit about tournaments and excuse me i only wanted to play cash and now i get so annoyed with cash i get tilted so easily in a cash game i will say (laughs) it's a powerful drug anyone that does venture into the tournament space they get one deep run and they are just like (laughs) oh my god i just can't there's just nothing like it yeah there's nothing like running deep in a tournament for sure you do have some new jewelry I do. I won a run good ring in Tunica, Mississippi a couple of weeks ago. I won the $300 ladies event for $5,000. Damn near one too. Yeah, I got third place in the deep stack event for $8,000. Unfortunately, the guy in that tournament, the the guy who ended up winning, he just had a dominant chip lead. He had like 50% of the chips in play when we were like seven handed. And um, the guy who got second place, I was sort of like at this what's it called like a crossroads like of a choice whereas like i can just sort of be uninvolved and wait for this guy to bust himself and the difference between third and second was like three thousand dollars is 8k versus 11k first place was 18 and then i got into this hand with the chip leader where i knew he was strong but i flopped a flush draw and i was like if i want any chance at winning i have to double here and and make my draw so uh, i went with it and unfortunately just bricked he had aces (laughs) So then he had like a five to one lead on the guy that's. Oh, yeah. I think they more. played heads up for five hands or something stupid. Yeah. No. It was a very quick final table. I did, the, did the runner up thank you for being aggressive? No. Should have. No, the runner up was the guy who actually wanted to chop really badly. And I and I was I blocked the chop in that event as well. And I just I quickly shut that down. and was like, sorry, I don't chop. Well, so while you've been uh, winning, I lost the only major competition that I've taken part in for the I'm last year. so humiliated year. for you. I engaged in a chicken nugget eating contest. <laughs> uh, it was one hour. Eat as many as you can. We were blind to each other. Do you know how many I ate? Did you tune in on Instagram? To I watch? did. I was one of the four viewers on Instagram Live supporting the chicken nugget off. Um, I didn't know it was going to happen, but I just saw that you were on Instagram Live and I <laughs> I clicked on it. And I was like, what is going on? There's a few things that I'm not proud of, but the total that I ate is not one of them. Uh, I ate 65 chicken nuggets in 60 minutes. Wow. I That's lost, but I'm still proud of that number. I think that would beat a lot of people, just not my opponent that particular day. What I'm not proud of is um, I soaked a few of them in water. <laughs> So that they would go so down gross. easier. <laughs> and it was gross. I don't recommend that. Oh, uh, I did nasty. make them go down easier, but let me tell you, they were dry. They were very, very dry. So, like, you don't want to be filling your belly with sauce and stuff, but you need something because they don't go down easy. They're very, I very dry. I would have gone with, like, a hot mustard. <laughs> oh, I, I had like a hot mustard at McDonald's. I had, like, seven dipping different sauce dipping, dipping sauces. So, I mean, uh, there was variety and just keep going down the line and all these different things, but... Turns out my opponent just had like yeah. Bowls. How many did your opponent eat? Seventy five. I lost by ten. Ugh. Yeah. He didn't eat very many because there was a halftime, right? You yeah. said he'd eat like way more at halftime, but he, he ate two eat. in the last thirty minutes. 
and he looked like he was going to vomit the entire time. Oh like the two nuggets, I, I went back because Jackie wanted to show me because I couldn't see him yeah, yeah. during the competition. And she's like, just just look at him here. He takes like one bite of a nugget, you know, at, and it had been 10 minutes and he takes 10 and he like th- spikes it back down on the plate. Like he was disgusted by it. He just wanted nothing to do with it. It was How so many gross. calories are in 60 nuggets? Did you um, do that bath? No, I don't know how many's in one. Otherwise, it'd be the pretty 20 easy. Count. Like I feel like, I feel like an eight count would be like four hundred. Hmm. So, like I feel like you ate like three to between three and four thousand calories for sure. Let's insert some ridiculous uh, joke about how I'm skinny, even though I ate sixty five chicken nuggets. You eat and once a day. While you, you spin eat a that, I'll look meal, up the calories. Like a snake. And then you fast for 20 hours again and eat another big meal. And then you're like, I don't know why everyone doesn't think I eat. I eat so much. I'm like, you spend more of your time fasting than eating, you dumb bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I ingested 12,545 calories. (laughs) So a lot. Wow. In one hour. (laughs) How did neither of you throw up? You think he did, though. That was the controversy. And here's another. Here's another. Well, I don't know. There was an unaccompanied visit to the bathroom. And if there was a vomit, then that means you're disqualified. He was allowed to shit, though. He just wasn't allowed to vomit. Yes. The claim was that it's it was a number two, not a secret door number three. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call anyone a liar or anything like that. But. Yeah, I wish I had known about this. I would have put so much money on you losing the eating competition. I would have like put there the was whole bets. bankroll on Craig not being able to out eat fucking anyone. <laughs> what's crazy is what's crazy is there was there was bets and there was betting lines made ahead of time to, in order to receive bets on the contest. Oh, you had to have been a huge dog. The initial line was one thirty eight and a half for the over under and we ate 140 what an incredible line incredible line phenomenal crazy so yep lost the chicken nugget eating contest but i hold my head high i think i set a good example for my children heck yeah (laughs) so we talked about tournament poker here in um the great state of texas let's talk about what's going on with the cash the cash environment obviously i'm most familiar you're most familiar with what's going on in austin so that's going to be informing our opinions don't yell at us if you're in san antonio or houston and everything's different but yes this is going to be obviously very very austin based very austin poker experience right now yep um a lot of cash games underground Despite it seems there like there's being... been a huge surge to the return of underground games. I feel like I am fielding three to five invitations every week. And they're inviting me as someone who they know is going to be out of town a good portion of the time. Yeah. I mean, the main game that I deal is a neighborhood game that's been around for... It started in like a golf 15 club. 15 years. Way, clubhouse, yes. yeah. And, and it has lasted, I mean, just way, way older than these poker clubs. So, so a lot of these people... So unusual for a cash game to, to survive If you were long. to bring some of these people when the poker that they know is that game and that's like the only game that they play, if you were to say to them, hey, go check out the lodge, they would go there and see two players with headphones on and be like, what the fuck is... Why did I drive to Round Rock for this? Because they're yeah. used to a very different experience. But that being said, there's games that have popped up this year, you know, since I feel since like there's a new the one every day. Been... And um, I mean, God bless the lodge. The lodge is trying their best to uh, to because it, it's obviously felt the biggest around like the mid stakes um, stake. So like two five doesn't really run at the lodge. Mm-hmm. They have as many one two games as you could ever want. They have a one two five PLO that's going to be running multiple tables and be probably one of the better plo games in the country everybody loves that plo game and then maybe a couple of one three tables that are grindy as hell every freaking person who moved to austin to make their living playing poker or playing these lodge one three games and they're pretty miserable i Um, think that's the answer to the question of why would people go underground why would they pay a rake when they can pay time and they're capped and they're capped games um at the lodge and they're obviously not going to be capped at a home game. And occasionally home games will cap um, depending on the, like I go to five, five games where they cap at like 5k or something like that. But it's mm-hmm. certainly not as aggressive a cap as you're going to find within the, the walls of the lodge. I think you've just found that the, the bigger players, they 
don't want to play with pros or they don't want to play with a bunch of yeah. pros. So they'd rather play somewhere private where they can say, no, you, no. And I mean, it's a social experience. They're going to be things at a home game that the lodge can't offer. They're not going to be offering like the blow. <laughs> yeah. Cocaine <laughs> is a huge thing. That's a huge reason why I don't like to play cash is because there's just like a pile of cocaine in the bathroom. That's just like, help yourself, sweetie. Like it's like a Halloween bowl of candy out front. And I'm playing with all these coked up guys till four in the morning. And I'm like, what is my life? And then just like my self-esteem for me goes down. <laughs> the other thing I've noticed when I play at the lodge is that every dealer is wearing a shirt. Which is interesting. Oh yeah, there there are and some the some massage therapists. more ex- extracurricular activities. Yeah. When I go to home games, I think a lot more of the tops stay on than when I'm not there. I think like whenever yeah. there's a woman at the game, they button it up a, like a little bit out of respect. But yeah, for sure, these 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 games offer a lot of extracurriculars that the lodge isn't going to offer. And God bless Doug. He's like, come join me and Pierre on Friday at noon for our 510 game. And we're always like, oh, okay. And then like Cinnabon. Cinnabon is supposed to be the draw, but it's like Cinnabon is the most winningest player on the lodge live stream yeah. for 2023. So it's like, come play with the best heads up player on the planet, uh, the best Euro pro in town, <laughs> and the most winningest lodge live stream player. Come play with us. Yeah. And granted, I have not tried out these games yet, and I've heard really good things. My buddy David says they're pretty dope, and he's enjoying them. And there are, like, a handful of players that are just, like, Cinnabon is one of these guys. My buddy Big Tony is one of these guys. They just they don't want to play underground games. They feel more safe and more comfortable, or their wives totally are more comfortable with that. them playing in, like, the walls of a regulated business. And that is more than fair, you know? You know, I understand both sides. I see both sides. I take part in both sides. But what if there's one side that really, truly doesn't understand the other, it's the people that play in the clubs. They say, I don't understand why anyone would play underground. And it's like, no, I, I understand why someone wouldn't want to play. You ask in the them clubs. and a lot of times they'll say, I get slow play. I get slow paid or I don't get paid on time. Yeah, and that's that can different... be like a huge thing with the with the home games is they're having to, you know, receive a lot of Zells and PayPal's and digital currency and to like keep a bank stocked of cash yeah. that you can um, make good on all of your. And a lot of times it's going to be like the 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 pro that's going to have to bear the brunt of being slow played and stuff. I've never, ever been slow paid at a game. I granted I'm not playing that big of games or like I haven't been crushing cash games enough to to be in that position, but it's certainly I've never thing. won, so I've never been slow played either. Yeah, you're down 2K and 1-2. You're basically a giant fish. Why do you even try? Yeah, some of that's micro. So yeah, Craig worse, thinks but... it's a really big deal that he's down two 2K in like three months or something. No, I'm I've... just fast forwarding nine months and I'm like, I'm going to have my first losing year in a decade. <laughs> Which is brutal. So hard for you. Brutal for me. <laughs> How do you feel about a top five, Caitlin, for old time's sake? Let's let's get off a top five. Top five bad behaviors we went with. Bad behavior. Bad yeah. behaviors at the table. Not necessarily unacceptable, but it's not good. Yeah. No. It's not good. No particular order here. I have uh slow rolls, which some people enjoy more than others. <laughs> some people desperately hate. I think they're fine. I like to do it to people that I love or hate. It's going to be one of the two. You're not you're not in the middle ground with me. If I slow roll you, I either love you or hate you and you probably know which one it is. I've been slow rolled one time where it was significant and it bought, but I didn't even clock it because I was so deep. So at the Poker Atlas 1 million dollar guarantee tournament in Dallas, I made it I don't know, fairly deep into day two. There are about like 60 players left, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood. And um, I cold four bet shoved with Ace King suited because that's what you do. But I was like deep as hell. I had like 35 or 40 blinds or something. And the original Rager, unfortunately, just like woke up with aces. But instead of just like he snap called with a chip, but then he like got up and started futzing with his backpack. Like he was getting ready to leave or something. (laughs) And the dealer had to like actually tell him, no, he just verbalized the call. So she had to tell him like, you have to put a chip forward. You have to turn over your hand now. Like he was very much like it was, and I didn't, it didn't even occur to a slow roll for me because the moment he snapped me off with the verbal like call or whatever, like I know what hand he has. Like we we each had like a million chips in a day too. Like I know what hand he has. And um, 
he eventually turned over the aces and they of course held and i was eliminated from the tournament and a friend texted me later to be like oh i heard that piece of shit slow rolled you or whatever and i was like oh i guess it was a slow roll it didn't even like i was just yeah uh, you i was don't... just so devastated to have run into a premium with a pre with a with a less premium premium yeah you don't seem to care so much about the slow roll. It's uh, it's one of those things that no. some people just get really upset about. It doesn't occur to me to do it. Like, maybe I would do it if I was on Max Payne Monday again and I had an opportunity to slow roll, like, Billy or Nick Vertucci or someone like that. But I wouldn't want to slow roll one of, like, the cute little girls, you know, yeah. that's there for aesthetics. There was a period of time when I would sit down at a table and I would tell everyone there that I would slow roll and tell everyone else that they're safe. <laughs> and that was like a fun little quip that I had for a while. But False sense of security. Uh, what about needles? How do you feel about needles? You've played oh, at games that one... I deal. You know that I will give the needle. Oh, yeah. Craig's Craig's got a smart mouth. <laughs> if you can't tell from our podcast, he's got a smart mouth in the box. Uh, but he doesn't do it too much because he, you know, he knows this, he's still at work or whatever. But he'll, he'll definitely dagger you when you're not ready for it. There's a line. There's a line that you can and cannot cross. But. Um, I'm the I queen like, of needles. If you open the door for me, I'll walk right in and shit in your living room. You know what I mean? There's been, <laughs> there has been times that I've had to text you when I'm in a game and I desperately need to needle someone and I need to make sure that that motherfucker lands. And I'm like, Caitlin, give me a needle. Here's the backstory. I always snap respond and I give you a gold one, yeah. don't I? I'm oh. like the best friend for this. Y'all, yeah. if y'all have my phone number, please use it this way. <laughs> I love receiving texts like, how do I make fun of so-and-so? And I'm like, oh yeah, I don't know. To ask him about his, his, his wife's crocheting business failures is, is like, he skinny i've got an endless <laughs> amount of skinny jokes is he skinny i fucking hate your dumb body craig <laughs> <laughs> poor chip stack management <laughs> so there are rules so to speak like large chips up front or up just, top. Like, stacking it like a dick i just always feel like people are like some like nerdy little theater kid if they're like no oh, look at my special tower that i made or oh look at that artful and i'm like play a hand yeah. how'd you have time to fucking do that play a hand dipshit and speaking of needles typically if someone is stacked their chips like an idiot the next pot they open when it gets to me i'm like how much are you playing because they have no idea they have mm -hmm. no clue like they have <laughs> absolutely no clue um and that's kind of the reason that we stack our chips is so you can you know know roughly how much is effective? How much is in play? What are we playing for here? You know, what are my implied odds if you give a shit about that kind of thing? Um, it's just one of those things that, you know, people take a, take three hands to stack up the pot they just won. is kind of annoying. Um, I sent a joke to a friend the other day. I was in the lodge, and this friend was also in the lodge, and he texted me, how's it going? And so I just switched my chip stack up just for this picture, and I sent him a picture back, and I said, I officially suck. I stack in tens now. <laughs> Because that's yeah. a dead giveaway to a lot of people that you suck if you stack in tens. Hundred um, percent. There might be one winning player in the world that stacks in tens, and I don't know who it is, but there's got to be one. Ugh, I'm still dubious. Next one I have. This is like a, a dealer behavior that I alluded to earlier. Um, releasing hands and mucking them. So like on the player side, when you're done with your hand, be done with it. Like no card funerals. You yeah. know, let's just you're folding. Be done with it. Let it go. Uh -huh. And then as the dealer, you know. Once that hand's released, like kill it. Yeah. And if it's not released, don't don't kill it. That's a, a problem for dealers. You know, seat one and seat nine or mm -hmm. ten, depending on the game. I have a hard time with that sometimes with players that insist on seating, you know, sitting nine, sitting one. They love those seats, but they also don't love capping their cards. And then occasionally <laughs> it's like, hey, where's my hand? I'm like, uh, in the muck. Your hand's in the muck because I thought you were done with it. You weren't paying attention and it wasn't capped. So. I yeah. scooped them. Sorry. You can play the next one, though. Does it ever bother you when the one in the nine seats are like, they got their hands out on the felt and they're just like in the way? Yeah, when they like get in the way of the pitch. You? Yeah. you know, so it's one of those things you can... I think I've finally become cognizant of that after like three years of playing most yeah. days. Usually you, you dink them a couple times with a card. They kind of get the idea. I mean, you don't do it on purpose, but like Ew. their hands do get in the way and they're like, oh, shit. Do you want me to move my hands? Yes. Yeah, get the fuck out of my way. I'm yes, working. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do want you to move your fucking hands. Thank you. <laughs> Last one is too drunk. So there's about eight subcategories to this one. There's like too drunk slowing the game down. There's too drunk playing like an asshole, There's which is fine yeah. for most people. But uh, too drunk, like you, you might as well not even be there. You're just folding every hand and getting more drunk. There's too drunk 
not stacking your chips correctly, not being capable. There's too drunk, being aggressive with people verbally or physically. Yeah. Anything to add to that one? Um, you're touching the woman at the table without her permission. That's the only one that ever really bothers drunk. me. Drunk is not an excuse for that. There yeah, is not you got to take me out to dinner to touch these titties. They're too good. They're too good. No, no free pause. <laughs> <laughs> they're too magnificent. I'm sorry. They're too magnificent. I can't give them out for free. So how they do we know? Dinner. Let's give a tip. Let's give a tip to our listening audience. How do you know when you're too drunk to be at the poker table? Um, if people are constantly like telling them telling you that the action is on you. I've certainly been too drunk at a couple of poker games, but I'm pretty good at taking myself home when I, when I've gotten too drunk. Like I can, I can read the room. You can pour But I'm yourself. also like, I'm a gas and a half. Like even when I'm being drunk and obnoxious, I'm pretty fucking funny. You can pour yourself into an Uber and find your way home. Yeah. Or I get Craig to take me home. <laughs> <laughs> How about a hand DD? review? Any interesting hands of late? Ugh, not really. I don't even, I so when I did the 10k I satellited into the 10k this last December at the win and I wrote down every single hand history I played in that event because I had sold 10% to a uh, chance because Chance Cornuth had uh, volunteered to buy people's actions that were or whatever and I had played with him and tabled a bluff in front of him so um he scooped up my 10 my 10%. And so I had recorded every single hand because part of his deal is like, if I buy your action, then I give you coaching like deep in the tournament. So I wanted every single hand recorded if I did make it to day four or whatever. I made it to day three. I made it pretty deep. But if I had made it to like final few table times and he was actually actively helping me, I wanted to be able to like show him what my thought, where my thought process and journey was at so far. Mm -hmm. but since then like i don't ever really write down hand histories i don't care about hand histories occasionally i'll see some from my friends like the other day my friend told me that she like cold shoved 18 bigs with five five and it was really hard for me to to not be like what the hell are you doing <laughs> if it was 2002 she played it perfect i know i was i was, I was like girl girl <laughs> what position were you in? There's not one that I'm okay with that. Just imagine all the worst hands that can call. Oh, God. Um, harsh but fair. Are you locked and loaded? Yeah, I can go first. Go for you it. Ready? Um, my harsh but fair is that you're a fucking liar and you keep fucking lying on me. Every time I see people when I go out at like the lodge and at home games, they're like, oh, so I guess you got too good for Craig now. I guess you're big time in Craig. You're not friends with Craig anymore. You you abandoned Craig and like, oh, and they make it seem like I like big timed and abandoned you when like you're literally still my friend. I text you all the time. I like go to all the events that you invite me to when I'm in town for them. I'm like, actually, you're a good friend and you're like lying on me and telling people that I've abandoned you or big timed you or outgrown you when none of that is true. I fucking like you, you piece of shit. Harsh but fair. Cool. You know the rules cool. of harsh but fair. <laughs> That's harsh and fair, I guess. <laughs> kind of kind of true. I don't know. I don't I don't feel as though I bad mouthed you all over He's town. He's bad mouthing me everywhere. I mean, maybe people are projecting it onto you and be. they're saying it on your behalf. I feel, like, I, I feel like I've had to defend myself in several conversations. Like every time I see Joe Strazera, Joe's like, oh, what happened to Craig? And I'm like, that motherfucker is my buddy and I love him. How dare you? <laughs> because it's so misused. I'm not even certain I know the definition of gaslighting, but I think you just gaslit me. Um, I think maybe other people gaslit me on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I have a double. A double? Okay. I did in, curse at you a lot. I guess in you this get to. This first one is very short, very quick. In this first one, I asked if you could get us into the commentary booth on a live stream. I've asked you more than once. You have not yeah, done it. I'm that sorry. upsets me. I want to do it. I think it would be okay. fun. Well, we know the Lodge staff loves to listen to <clears> our <throat> stream, so please invite us into the booth. The we, second is, we, I thought, we once, we, for you. once we get back on live mics, I just thought, you know what? I ingested... Over 12,000 calories in a single sitting, I will at least get some respect. No. And still, no. No. Fuck off. Gain 20 pounds. What do I Gain. have to do? Way more than 160 pounds, Craig. I've never at done that six in my foot life. tall. 
I've never done that in my life. I don't know how. That's such a low bar. I weighed 160 pounds in the seventh grade, probably. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I don't know how to do that. So maybe some other. So I just, you're just never going to win my respect. It's fine. You just have to live with that. So I don't play poker tournaments and I won't gain weight. So those are like the only two ways. The only I can way gain to earn respect. my respect. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just not being a good good father and friend is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Reach my center, it's Craigers. Well, that's it. That's all I got. That's all <laughs> that I got ha- for to cover a year's worth of absence. It is harsh but fair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to the Texas Poker Experience. I had so much fun being back here with my good friend, Craig, who I never would big time ever. And um, we hopefully can have some more episodes coming out. If there's anything that you would like to hear about Texas Poker, things that you have questions about, uh, please find us on Instagram at Texas Poker Experience or on our YouTube channel if you are ingesting this audio Lee and on our audio Lee's if you're <laughs> ingesting this video Lee. Um, I'm Caitlin Kvesky. I'm Craig Sear. Don't be a nit. And remember to put this straddle on. <laughs> I forgot that was our tax. <laughs> <laughs>